material science and electrical engineering, and his group focuses on integration of nanoscale electronic materials for diverse applications, amongst which are low power electronics, flexible circuits and sensors, and energy generation and harvesting. Uh, Professor Javi's research has been uh, recognized by many, many awards, the latest one being the Dan Maiden Prize in Nanoscience. Before I hand it over to Professor Javi, I just wanted to remind our audience listening to us online that they can write their questions through the Q&A option of the webinar, and I'll keep track of the questions and can ask them on their behalf. So with that, thank you for joining us, and the floor is yours. All right, thank you. Um, it's really great to, uh, to be here, to be back here uh, at MIT seeing uh, old colleagues. Uh, but also uh, seeing some of my uh, former students uh, whose work I'm going to discuss uh, today. You guys have been recruiting my uh, former students quite a bit, uh, and uh, they're all sitting together uh, in the back. Um, uh, so, uh, so thank you for, uh, for having me uh, today. Uh, so uh, for the purpose of today's lecture, I'm going to try to tell you uh, what we have learned over the past several years um, on um, using two-dimensional semiconductors for optoelectronic applications. And I'm going to tell you um, what um, advances we have, uh, we have uh, made, uh, what uh, challenges we have faced, and what are the opportunity areas uh, that I think are really exciting moving forward. Uh, so uh, before I start, let me thank these guys, uh, the students and postdocs uh, who have uh, contributed to the, to the work over the years. Um, and uh, the graduate students are on top, postdocs in the middle, and uh, just a, a subset of the undergrads. And not all of the undergrads are listed and not all of the students are listed. And in particular, uh, Sheikh, uh, he's actually sitting in the back. Uh, I'm going to be talking about a lot of his work. And, um, and the same goes with uh, Hangzhen um, and Dershin and Naoki. All right, so I think for the purpose of this room, I don't need to give you much introduction. Um, uh, in general, you have these two-dimensional semiconductors. The classic material would be graphene. Um, within each sheet, the bonds are covalent. Between the bonds, uh, between the layers, the bonds are van der Waals. And uh, uh, they exhibit a new class of materials. Many of them are semiconductors. And they all have different band gaps, different uh, properties. And uh, they represent the thickness of scaling limit if you can just peel off or process or fabricate a single sheet, a monolayer. Uh, you have uniform thickness down at the uh, atomic level. So you don't have any material surface roughness in principle. Um, the surfaces are all perfect, we think, um, as the schematics depict. In reality, that's not the case. We have a lot of defects. There are a lot of missing atoms. There are a lot of atoms. There are a lot of uh, uh, holes in these materials. But at least um, the bonds are all self-terminated. And so keep that in mind. You have materials that have the surfaces with all surf, um, that are all self-terminated, -term but defects exist. So for the purpose of this talk, I'm going to try to tell you um, um, what unique properties they exert. Uh, are they good optoelectronic materials? Are they good for LEDs? Uh, are they bright enough? Are they efficient enough? Um, and, um, and I will tackle this question from two angles. First, I'm going to talk about the photophysics of the system. I'm going to talk about what are the various recombination processes, radiative, non-radiative. What's, what's the role of defects? How do defects uh, play into uh, to the various uh, recombination pathways, the recombination rates? And, uh, and then I'll talk about some applications, uh, unique applications specifically for mid IR, which, which I think uh, the 2D materials, specifically black phosphorus, I will show you results, is already beating the state of the art commercial devices. All right. So uh, just one more background slide. Um, a lot of the uh, slides will have photoluminescence quantum yield. I think many of you are familiar, but very briefly, this is kind of a textbook process, uh, characterization process. 
You basically uh, excite a material by light. So you use a uh, optical pump, just usually a laser um, and you uh, generate electron hole pairs um, or in the case of some of these two dimensional systems, you create excitons and, uh, and then you measure light out. So you're putting light in, you know how many photons you're shining on the material, how many photons the material is absorbing and you're measuring the light out. The question is of these electron hole pairs that you created, how many of them give you light out versus heat? So that's the ratio of radiative rate versus the total recombination rate. Of course, you want this quantum yield to be close to 100%. That's the objective. So if you have 100% quantum yield, the material is only uh, giving you light out. There is no heat dissipation to the zeroth order. <laughs> All right, uh, so, uh, so let me, with that, let me just uh, share with you some of our findings. This is a work that uh, was uh, led by Sheikh and Dershin in our group. And we started looking at the photophysics of these two dimensional systems. And we started doing photoluminescence quantum yield measurements as a function of doping, as a function of background charge. And here we induce the background charge by uh, applying a gate voltage, so electrostatically. So we have a material, we can change the uh, gate voltage, we can move the Fermi level around, and we can measure then the photoluminescence characteristics. Now here, what you're looking at uh, is the uh, photoluminescence uh, spectra of this uh, device. In this case, the device is a monolayer of MOS2. Uh, when the gate voltage is zero, and when the gate voltage is minus 20 volts, and you can see that the material becomes dramatically brighter when you apply a negative gate voltage. We're not doing any chemical treatment. We're not doing any, any surface treatment, just applying electric field. And uh, so the question is why, and, um, and, and can we do this a little more carefully and quantitatively? So we measured the photoluminescence quantum yield uh, as a function of generation rate, which is your laser intensity, the incident laser intensity. Think about that as exciton, uh, concentration, you can convert it to exciton concentration as a function of gate voltage. And um, now in the case of MOS2 monolayer, when you apply minus 20 volts, the Fermi level is near mid gap. So the material is more or less intrinsic. You don't have that many excess electrons. You don't have that many excess holes in the material. The background charge is low. Um, and we see that the material is brightest when the Fermi level is near mid gap. And you can see that in fact, in this material, the photoluminescence quantum yield when the generation rate is low is near unity, is near 100%. Now, if you uh, increase the gate voltage to zero volts or 20 volts, the Fermi level moves up closer to conduction band, the background charge goes up, the background electron concentration goes up. And what ends up happening is that you form negatively charged trions. So rather than having a electron hole pair and exciton that is neutral, you end up having a, a three particle system, basically two electrons and one hole that becomes a, a trion. And in that case, what we see is that the material becomes very, uh, very dim. The luminescence efficiency drops down by several orders of magnitude. Now, these materials are not perfect. They're very defective. The defect densities are extremely high. And yet what the experiment depicts is that uh, um, when the material is intrinsic or the background charge is low, when you have predominantly neutral excitons, the non radio recombination is very small. You predominantly undergo radio recombination despite the presence of defects. But once you form charged trions, then, then uh, the non radio path opens up significantly. Now, the results are interesting. You can get 100% luminescence yield, even in the presence of large defect densities. But the problem is you can only see that at low generation rates. For practical devices, that's useless. Uh, you don't care about an LED that is barely on. You want an LED that is really bright. So the question was, how do we mitigate this droop and what, what causes it? Just looking at the slope of uh, this curve, you can, you, can, you can see that it's a bimolecular process. So we had attributed this droop to exciton exciton annihilation. When the exciton concentration is large, you undergo a non-radiative process, which is exciton annihilation. Now, more recently, uh, again, a work that was done by Sheikh and Hing Jun Kim, um, what they found is that if you apply a small strain, a mechanical strain to these monolayers, then you can actually suppress exciton exciton annihilation. 
So in this case, you can see the plot on the right. Now the, um, there's a mechanical strain being applied. In this case, it's a tensile strain of 0.4%. And uh, by applying strain, by moving the Fermi level to the mid gap, which is done by applying a negative gate voltage, you can see that you can get a uh, high quantum yield close to 100%, not exactly 100% at all generation rates. And so we were able to suppress exciton, exciton annihilation by applying a small strain. Now, this is something that we're still trying to better understand what, uh, what exactly is happening. And we have some ideas, but basically your uh, exciton, exciton annihilation rate, again, it's a non-radiative process. We don't want it. Um, is given by the joint density of state at the transition energy, uh, which in this case is two times the exciton binding energy times the matrix element. So we are somehow modulating either the joint density of states or uh, the matrix element favorably by, by applying strain. And we're not quite sure which one uh, still we are affecting more, but one thought is that one possible mechanism is that you have these Van Holt singularities in uh, these two dimensional systems. And, uh, and that's what the joint density of state is depicting. And it just happens that um, these Van Holt singularities overlap with two times EX. And that's what the preliminary DFT results is showing. But again, we need, we need to look that up more carefully. And by applying a strain, then you shift the system off resonance. Now, just to kind of give you a summary slide uh, of, of the finding of the photophysics finding, um, we have huge defect densities in these materials. These materials are not perfect. They are, we buy rocks. These are, some of these materials are rocks. They're rocks that are, that are extracted from, from ground. We exfoliate them and uh, they're very defective, very high defect densities. And uh, so here I'm plotting the luminescence versus the defect density. And despite the presence of high, uh, large defect densities, we can get close to 100% luminescence yield. You can see that if you move to gallium nitride system, for example, um, forget it, at those defect densities, your luminescence yield is not, um, is, is not measurable. And that's really an inherent advantage of the system that uh, despite the large presence of defects, uh, we can still get high quantum yield. Now, we think the finding is simply because uh, they're excitonic. And uh, we, we think that in an excitonic system, as long as the binding energy is large enough, um, as long as you can maintain the particles in the form of neutral excitons, you should be able to emit light. Now, the question is, does this also hold true for quantum dots? And, uh, but of course, as, long, as soon as you put extra charge in the quantum dot, then you form trion and the story completely changes. So we are, we're doing some preliminary, we have some preliminary results extending this finding to other material systems. And it looks like the, the, the finding is generic, is, is really, is really um, true for all excitonic systems. Now we have a material that is bright. The question is, how do we, how, how do we make a device out of it? How do, we, how do we put contacts? How do we electrically inject charge? And, uh, and if we, we do so, can we make a uh, light emitting device that is, that is also bright. Now a challenge in the field uh, that many of you are familiar with is that the contacts are hard and making only contacts to, uh, to these 2D materials, both for electrons and holes on the same device is, is quite challenging today. And so rather than making a standard LED device, uh, we uh, uh, adopted a, a, a um, kind of a, uh, a device concept which was explored before, but within a different context. Um, we basically fabricate a MOS capacitor. We have our uh, monolayer semiconductor contacted by just one electrode, one source electrode, and uh, there is a gate. So it's just a MOS capacitor. We apply uh, an AC voltage between the source and the gate. And again, the semiconductor has only one contact. And then what we see is we see light emission during voltage transients. So the idea is very simple. If you apply a positive gate voltage, you charge up the semiconductor, you get negative charges. If you apply a negative gate voltage, you get holes, you have electrons and holes. And if you can quickly go back and forth, then you can have a co-population of electrons and holes. 
Now this picture doesn't depict how charge injection takes place. And you have these big shot key barriers. How do I, how do I inject charge efficiently um, as I flip the voltage? And so for that, we looked at the energy band diagrams. If you look at the energy band diagram going from the metal to the semiconductor, so looking at the MS junction, um, this is a case where you have a very large shot key barrier height, for example, a mid gap shot key barrier height. The band gap is about two EV. Uh, so you're talking about one electron volt of shot key barrier height. That's really large. One electron volt shot key barrier height, you should not be able to inject any charge. So if we apply a, a negative gate voltage and we look at the steady state, so the voltage is on for some amount of time, then you see that the, um, there is some band bending at the MS junction. And then you see that the um, um, further away from the contact, the Fermi level is close to the valence band. And um, clearly we have accumulated holes in this case. Now, if you flip the voltage, the voltage in this case is a MOS capacitor, typically gets dropped across the oxide, across the capacitor. But if you flip the voltage fast enough, the semiconductor cannot respond fast enough. You cannot charge the semiconductor fast enough. So all the voltage ends up getting dropped at the metal semiconductor junction instead for just a short fraction of second. So you end up with very large band bending. I mean, look at this conduction band. The conduction band is below the Fermi level of the, level of the metal by two electron volts within a few nanometers. So this is during that voltage transient. And what ends up happening for a fraction of second, electrons can now very quickly tunnel into the system. And as long as you do this fast enough before the holes go back, then you have a co-population of electrons and holes and you get light emission um, in this device. So for a fraction of second, we made the contacts ohmic for electron and hole injection. This is a very simple, simple uh, structure. Now in terms of voltage scaling, if you can, and we have shown this before, if you can make the oxide thin, just a few nanometers, it doesn't have to be that thin. Um, what we have shown is that uh, you can reduce the operating voltage of this device to be the band gap of the semiconductor. So if you have uh, a semiconductor with two, uh, a band gap of two EV, the voltage ends up being two volts. All right, so, uh, so this is a concept. And uh, so uh, one of our undergrads uh, who, is, uh, who is now a graduate student at the other place uh, at, at Harvard, but somehow she's here, uh, Joy Cho, um, she, uh, she actually synthesized uh, tungsten sulfide monolayers on a chip. So the CVD of tungsten sulfide monolayers. So now we have a chip with uniform monolayer of tungsten sulfide. And she used this device concept, the AC, electroluminescence device concept, the MOS capacitor. And she was able to uh, make a uh, uh, centimeter scale proof of concept display. And, uh, and uh, she chose uh, three randomly selected letters, uh, C-A-L, go bears. Um, and uh, and uh, she, uh, she was able to basically show um, pretty bright um, uh, emission. Now, I ask her, I'm like, okay, we can, we can measure the, the, the power intensity and all that. Uh, uh, tell me the brightness, give me an analogy of the brightness level. And she said, well, the brightness of these devices is the same as, uh, roughly the same as the hot plates in the lab. The hot plates that have a little red display, that's how bright these devices roughly are. And this is just a monolayer. The emitter is just a monolayer in thickness. So they're pretty bright. Now, once we came up with this concept, the AC electroluminescence concept, then we said, well, you know, in, in principle, we can, we can inject charge into anything uh, without having to worry about contacts. Can we use the same concept to inject charge into organics, into quantum dots using a very simple device structure? And in this case, again, we have the same MOS capacitor. Forget about the, what is metal. It doesn't matter. The choice of metal can be anything. And, uh, and you make the device and then you can just dep uh, deposit your quantum dots, your, your organic films, whatever you want on top. And indeed the same generic device structure uh, with the electrodes being properly designed such that you know, there's a network of source electrode, they're closely spaced and that network is made of carbon nanotubes. So we have metallic carbon nanotubes that are providing the source. 
um, works for all sorts of materials, quantum dots, aromatics, uh, polymers, the metallic complexes. We can excite all these different materials using the same device platform. And uh, you, know, you can go from infrared to UV. We are not engineering the contacts. The device is generic. We don't engineer the contacts and uh, we just fabricate the device. And on top of it, you drop cast um, or, or spin code or, or evaporate whatever thin film you want um, and, uh, and it works. So the question then is voltage scaling and uh, do you need to apply tens of volts before previously all the work that was done on AC electroluminescence devices, people had to apply tens of volts to get any light emission. So the, volt, the operating voltage is very high. And here, what we showed experimentally is that if you make a thin oxide, uh, for example, eight nanometer thick zirconium oxide as our gate dielectric, um, then you can approach uh, the, uh, the operating voltages approaching the band gap. Actually, it ends up being band gap divided by two just because we're applying plus or minus uh, voltage. Um, I'm not showing the results here, but in the same paper, we also do um, uh, the efficiency. We do uh, power efficiency measurements and, uh, uh, and, and the power efficiency measurements are comparable to the competing vertical OLED uh, devices. And uh, the, the only exception here is the fabrication is so easy. Now, what can we do with it? Well, now I can grab a chip and I can monolithically fabricate large arrays of light emitting devices with different colors. And uh, I can create a ar ar uh, 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 arbitrary light source. And so in this case, uh, our student Vivian Wang uh, show that you can fabricate an array of seven by seven, so 49 different pixels. Each pixel is a different color, is, 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 has a different emissive layer on it. And the device structure I showed you, we fabricate the devices first, and then we just go on each pixel and we just simply um, uh, micro dispense a different emitter, a different quantum dot or different, different polymers or small molecule. And, um, and so we have, uh, in this case, 49 different sources. They all have a different spectral response. We can individually turn them on. We can individually turn them on at different intensities. We can get whatever light, uh, uh, we can get whatever spectrum we want. And here we just went from 450 to, uh, uh, to about, I think, uh, 800 nanometers, but, but we can of course go much, much wider. Um, now, what can we do with this? Well, we have now shown in this paper that we can use this, uh, these arrays uh, using compressive reconstruction algorithms uh, to perform spectroscopy measurements using this chip-based source without any diffractive op optics. And, uh, and uh, you know, this, uh, today you can actually buy um, devices, light sources that have 20 maybe LEDs on them and they cost $20,000. And these are LEDs that are individually mounted and packaged. Uh, and here now we can do all of that on a single chip. All right, now I'm gonna change the wavelength range and I'm gonna talk about another uh, interesting class of 2D materials, which is, uh, which is uh, black phosphorus. Um, the, the band gap of black phosphorus is uh, in mid uh, wave IR, uh, it's about 0.3 electron volt. And uh, mid IR is, is kind of an interesting, interesting uh, domain. Uh, there are a lot of emerging applications, actually a lot of applications that have been studied extensively in imaging, sensing, spectroscopy. And yet the uh, existing mid IR light sources are extremely poor. The best commercial mid IR LED that you can get is less than 1% efficient. And they're very expensive. And the reason is OJ recombination. OJ recombination exponentially depends on one over the band gap. And uh, as you shrink the band gap, as you go to around 0.3 electron volts, for example, indium arsenide, um, this is a theoretical quantum yield calculation as a function of carrier concentration. You can see that for even moderate carrier concentrations, your theoretical quantum yield is really low. This is for a perfect material, assuming there is no SRH, there are no defects, there's no surface recombination, only OJ. And, um, 
and of course, these carry concentrations are way too low for any practical device. Of course, you want to be much higher. Now, in the case of black phosphorus, the OJ recombination is actually quite low, the OJ recombination rate. And the reason is, for the same band gap, um, what also matters is the effective masses, the, the ratio of the effective masses of electrons and holes. And black phosphorus has a more symmetric effective mass. Um, and so what ends up happening is that results in a significantly lower OJ recombination rate theoretically. So the question is, okay, can we experimentally show that? And can we make experimental devices that are brighter than commercial devices? So for that, we once again started with basic photos, uh, photophysics experiments. And um, uh, again, Sheikh's name is here. Uh, he worked with uh, another postdoc in our lab, Naoki. And so they first started by looking at um, basic photophysics uh, characteristics of this material, understanding the various recombination, non-rated recombination rates as you change the thickness of this material. And um, now black phosphorus is interesting. The bulk band gap is about 0.3 electron volt. So when it's thick, the band gap is 0.3 electron volt, but as you, uh, make it into thin layers, for example, one layer, the band gap now is about 1.7 electron volt. So as you shrink it, the band gap opens up. And uh, so we measure the photoluminescence quantum yield as a function of thickness. And here I'm showing you how it looks for the thinner materials for the five, four, three, two, one layers. And you can see that the quantum yield actually exponentially shoots up. The trend matches what you would expect for just a theoretically calculated uh, exciton uh, radiative rate given the binding energy. So here the binding energy is, is shooting up as you make the material, the exciton binding energy is shooting up as you make the material thinner and the radiative rate shoots up. So within this range, the material is um, excitonic. Now, the problem is within this range, the material is not in mid IR. So this is not the range that we really care about the range that we really care about is when the material is thicker. For example, four nanometers and thicker. There, the, the band gap is bulk. The material is, more, is, 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 is in mid IR. So here we grab materials with different thicknesses from four nanometers all the way to 600 nanometers. We measure the photoluminescence quantum yield as a function of uh, uh, generation rate. And uh, then you can fit the ABC model here. And in this case, uh, this is a classic model where you basically um, look at three coefficients, the A, B, and C. A gives you the, the defect processes, the, the SRH and the surface recombination. Uh, B is your radiative term, and uh, C is your OJ. This is, this is a valid model when you're, you have a free carrier system. When the, the black phosphorus is thick, it behaves like a free carrier system. So we extracted the OJ recombination. We extracted the surface recombination from, from fitting these curves. And, um, and this is how classically the OJ and, and, and uh, surface recombination is, is extracted. The OJ that we extracted is, is what was expected uh, from the theory. So it ended up being very low. But what was surprising is that the surface recombination velocity that we measured in this material, um, that's the measure of how fast you're losing your carriers non-radiative at the surface. We have a lot of surface defects always, and the this, this, this defects are sinks for carrier. The, the, the carriers that you basically undergo non-radiative defect assisted recombination. The value that we measure is three times 10 to minus three. And for those of you who are familiar with SRV, the surface recombination velocity, typically that exponential ter term is plus three. So here our uh, surface recombination velocity is extremely low. And in fact, it's two orders of magnitude lower than anything else that has ever been measured. Um, before this work, the lowest surface recombination was uh, reported by Eli Ablonovic, uh, my, my colleague. And um, he looked at silicon for a perfectly passivated silicon. Um, the, the value is roughly two orders of magnitude higher than what we are reporting. Now, this was surprising because those who work with black phosphorus know that this material oxidizes. This material, this material is known, to, is notorious for being unstable. 
Now, what we found is if it's monolayer, bilayer, trilayer, when it's super thin, the wavelength range that we don't care about, the material is unstable. We had difficulties measuring it. We had to be very careful doing, it, doing the measurements in vacuum and, and handling it in vacuum. But when it's thick, it oxidizes, but the oxide seems, seems to be self-terminating, just like silicon oxidizing and forming a native oxide. And you will get a um, couple of nanometers of oxide and it stops. And the material is pretty stable beyond that. And so, in fact, these measurements are done in air. The processing is done in air. Um, we grab the material, we treat it with oxygen plasma to beat up the surface. And the value still remains the same. We couldn't kill the surface recombination even by doing oxygen plasma. So the material is actually pretty robust, um, at least from the uh, surface characteristic. Now, why it's, uh, the surface recombination is so low? Um, well, the bonds are all self-satisfied. So we have this 2D material within each layer, the bonds are all self-satisfied. You don't have these dangling bonds that you have to treat. And, um, and of course we have defects, but the number of defects is a lot less than your dangling bonds. And there is an oxide, but we think that the oxide is layer by layer. We think that the oxide, for example, if one layer starts to oxidize, it fully oxidizes. So it's not that you have layers that are partially oxidized. We have, because if you have layers that are partially oxidized, then you should have much higher SRV. So we think that that's the reason. And the question is, is this generic for all 2D materials? So we have a program on that to, to measure. All right, now, um, uh, even with these low uh, surface recombination velocities and OJ rates, uh, they are low, but the OJ rate is still relatively high. It's very low for mid IR, but it's relatively high. So the question is, how can we enhance the luminescence uh, yield even more? And so for that, we just transfer these materials onto a cavity, a cavity that is uh, optimally designed uh, so that you get a, a per cell effect enhancement. And we were able to show that we can get quantum yields that are on the order of 20% with cavity. So, so now you have this mid IR material with roughly 20% quantum yield. Um, where does it stand if you compare with uh, um, the uh, theoretical quantum yield efficiencies for different materials? So these are the theoretical quantum yield efficiencies, just, uh, just uh, given a reasonable defect densities and that, that people have reported and the OJ rates. Um, in black phosphorus, you can really go through very high generation rates, very high brightness levels. Forget it, for indium arsenide and this, this is supposed to be indium antimonide. For indium antimonide, for these materials, a classical 3.5s, you can't even get close to those high generation rates. All right. So then we started building some uh, LEDs and uh, for uh, grabbing black phosphorus and building an LED. And in this case, uh, we just built a vertical device on a cavity, coupled to a cavity, um, optical cavity. And in this case, we use MOS2 and ITO as the top contact. Uh, you don't have to use MOS2. You can actually use other solution process contacts, for example, things that organic or perovskite community use, and they also work. And uh, so this is a demonstration of a LED now, uh, black phosphorus LED operating in uh, mid-wave IR. Um, the students fabricate a bunch of devices. And uh, here you're looking at the external quantum efficiencies, the wall plug efficiencies um, as a function of uh, current density. And you can see that our best champion device or best device is about 4%. The external quantum efficiency is about 4%. Okay, so black phosphorus, the wavelength is 3.65 micron. The LED efficiency, the peak uh, external quantum efficiency is 4.4%. Um, commercial devices, where are they? Um, the commercial devices operating in a similar wavelength range are less than 1%. So uh, we are already uh, better than commercial devices without doing much materials or device optimization. Now the question of course is lifetime, are these devices stable, reliable? Can you operate them for many hours? Uh, again, there are questions about black phosphorus oxidation. For photoluminescence, we don't have a problem with oxidation when it's relatively thick, the thicknesses that we care about. But when you make an LED, if you're running it at high injection levels, at high current densities, 
then you can really undergo a lot of oxidations induced by all the hot carrier effects. And, uh, and indeed, that's what we see. So if you have a bird device, just a device that is made, not, not encapsulated, not, not packaged, the device only lasts uh, a short amount of time. It only lasts a few seconds before it burns. But if you package it, and, and this is an example of a packaged device, and um, this is a work that we are doing in collaboration with uh, our industry colleagues, Asbil, and uh, for the package device, fully packaged device, the students uh, were able to, Naoki and Shago, Shago-san, they, they ran the device for uh, 100 hours continuously and no degradation. Um, we, had to, we had to turn off the device. So at the end, the, the, we have individual points because we had to turn off the, uh, our setup, the detector, we had to pour liquid nitrogen again. And so that's why the points are discrete. So we couldn't get the lifetime to, from doing room temperature measurements. So we had to do accelerated lifetime measurements. So we uh, um, operate a device at, at increased temperatures, 80, 100, 120, 140. We extracted the, uh, the activation energy for degradation. And from that, we extracted the half lifetime at room temperature of 15,000 hours. So these are pretty robust devices. All right, now um, I'm gonna just highlight one other unique property of uh, black phosphorus, which is its band gap is very sensitive to strain. And that's just because of the crystal structure of black phosphorus. And um, Hyung Jin Kim showed uh, two years ago that by just applying plus or minus 1% strain, um, you can go from uh, about 0.25 electron volt all the way to 0.55 electron volt. You can dynamically change the band gap by applying strain. And the way he was applying strain was by just bending. So these, were, these devices were built on a thick plastic substrate and he was bending the plastic substrate as he was doing the measurements. He also made similar LEDs and he was able to show that he could dynamically go back and forth and anywhere in between, in fact, by applying compressive tensile strain. So you have now an LED that can dynamically change its color in the mid IR emission wavelength. It's not a color, of course. Um, and again, this is a range where technologically is important for, for example, for spectroscopy. So as a proof of concept, he showed uh, using these devices as a light source for gas sensing. And um, so by applying, for example, 0.2% compressive strain, he was able to selectively detect CO2. When he was applying 0.3% Tensile strain, he was able to selectively measure methane. So he was able to um, tune the emission wavelength to overlap with the absorption peak of uh, methane and, and CO2. All right, now this is my last slide. So black phosphorus, we cannot readily synthesize it as of now uh, on a wafer. Um, so we typically buy big crystals and we exfoliate small flakes. And that's not, I can't build a technology using that approach. And so the question is, can I do scalable processing of black phosphorus? Can I have a wafer that has a thin film of black phosphorus on it with a high optoelectronic performance with the high quantum yield that I talked about? And the answer is yes. And I will just highlight some of the results. And uh, that's a four inch wafer and it has a uniform black phosphorus thin film on it. We can do that on quartz, we can do it on glass, we can do it on different polymers. We have now a process to synthesize and process BP films wafer scale with similarly high quantum yields. And in fact, we can just grab this, put it in front of a flashlight from Amazon and that's what they have done you can get a very bright flashlight, just a uh, white light flashlight, really bright flashlight for just $20 or $30. And you can put this on top of it. And uh, this would be a very bright, this is a very bright uh, uh, mid IR phosphor, much brighter than anything else you can achieve today using any technology. All right, so that's it. So uh, with that, I'm gonna go to the, the conclusions and outlook. 
So what, what have we learned? So we looked at these 2D materials uh, initially for the transition metal dichalcogenides, the MOS2, tungsten sulfide, tungsten selenide. And we looked at the photophysics and, uh, and there seems to be, um, based on the experimental results, um, an obvious finding that an excitonic system tends to be more defect tolerant. That as long as you can maintain the particles in the form of neutral exciton, they predominantly undergo radiative recombination. Is this globally true? Maybe, I'm not sure. And um, of course, quantum dots have been extensively studied. And, um, and in the case of quantum dots, it's really important to, to get the encapsulation right, the, the, the ligands just right. And um, so the question that we have is, uh, what are the ligands doing? Are, are they just controlling the charge in the quantum dot or are they passivating the surface? Or, they, or, or is it both? And so we have some ongoing projects on that. We're excited about AC electroluminescence. Now we are using that technique to excite other things, not just molecules. We are also using this technique to excite cells. So we're going into the biological systems. And uh, finally, black phosphorus, um, really we think has magical properties in mid IR. All right, so with that, thank you very much. And I will take any questions or comments that you may have. Thank you. Thank you. So we have, thanks a lot for a wonderful talk. We have some time for questions. So any question in the audience? If not, I'll start with some of the online questions. So can you comment on your AC LEDs uh, in terms of operation frequency? What sort of frequencies do you usually use? Um, very good question. So uh, the, um, the frequency, the, the number of voltage transients uh, per, per second or per minute per second, um, that affects, um, the number of cycles of light emission that you get. And what we see is as long as we are below 10 megahertz or so, we more or less see a linear change in intensity, integrated intensity over time versus frequency. That makes sense. Beyond that, we see a droop. Uh, uh, it doesn't linearly go up and that's because of the parasitics, the parasitics of the system, the RC delay times of the system, of our device, which can be improved, the, the bond pads and all that. Um, now, what really matters is the transient time. So the question is whether you apply a sine wave or a square wave. And the key really is to apply, uh, at least for the inorganic devices, the devices ha that have finite mobility, you have to apply square wave with very fast transients. Because otherwise, holes will slowly diffuse out, they, they will drift out, and the, the Fermi level keeps moving, and then, and then the electrons come. By the time electrons come, it's too late, the holes are, are all gone. So, um, so how fast we need to flip the voltage, that's, that's really important. That depends on a number of factors, including the mobility, the mobility of the material. And for uh, most of the inorganic systems, we see that you need that transient to be on the order of few nanoseconds. So within 10 nanoseconds. So typically that's what we do. We change the voltage within 10 nanoseconds. So that's our transient time. For the organics, the mobility is almost zero. I mean, it's, it's not quite zero, but it's very low. And so there we can, we can apply sine waves and, um, and uh, with, with the frequency being the frequency of uh, uh, the excitation. Um, so there, uh, even a sine wave works just fine. Yep, makes sense. So you're, oh, so you're a huge, you're huge. <laughs> Your huge change in the band gap. It, it might be band, because of my mic. It was band gap and uh, black phosphorus, right? You had like two electron volt change in the energy, right? When With you, the thickness? When you bent it, when you strained it. Uh, not two electron volts. Uh, oh, did I miss that? I thought it said, maybe I missed the scale, but I thought you had two EV. Let's see if we can get the- Oh, two to four microns. Microns. Oh, okay, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was, yeah. I was reading electron. Okay. Yeah. So, so I, can we? I was, can, okay. I, perfect. Okay, I was really impressed there for a little bit. Yeah. So, <laughs> so let's see. No, I, think, I was really impressed yeah, overall. So, 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 so here, uh, okay. so the, uh, you can go from uh, two point, let's okay. say two point three or so uh, micron to about five point five micron, or on top you can read the the electron volts. So I like to look at electron volts too. 
Okay. And okay. So, that, so I always ask my I, students to, to put electron volts, okay. but especially in mid IR, everybody talks about micron. Okay, I wasn't reading the, the thing, okay. Yeah, yeah, so that was a compromise. So I, I, I have to see electron volts, <laughs> that's, so, that's the so, compromise. Okay, so we're on yeah. black, black phosphorus. When you, when you oxidize it, you know, you said it, you said one layer just completely oxidizes rather than going down, it, it's kind of self-passivating, kind of like maybe like aluminum metal does this, right? You know, and, and different things. Can, can you use that as a, I mean, I, you didn't tell us how you encapsulated your black phosphorus, but I suspect that's a little bit of a secret, maybe not, but can you oxidize it and make a passivating layer that way? Um, yeah, so, um, uh, okay. So the only, I guess, because of the IP issues, I will not go over the detail. But um, I think there's also there is on Zoom too, and uh, but maybe offline I could I could tell you. Uh, but I would just say that the devices are all fabricated in air, so the black phosphorus has seen oxygen throughout processing. That's that's our general processing scheme for making LEDs. Now I didn't show photo detectors. We can also make really good photo detectors with highest detectivities in mid IR. There you really have to be careful not to oxidize PP because um, for detectors, um, the oxide is known to also dope the surface, the black phosphorus oxide, and that changes your dark current. So, um, so for detectors, it's really sensitive. For LEDs, it's not, without answering your question. <laughs> Maybe I can just add to that. Uh, so the, since stress and strain do matter from perspective of your responsivity or the color emission, um, do you need to worry about controlling it as you're depositing it for these different thicknesses or even in your four inch wafer? Is that a significant control valve you need to worry about? Oh yeah, so, um, so, right, so it's very easy to, um, to make them to be relaxed. Um, when you're doing transfer, if you're using a transfer-based process, uh, it's, uh, it's, um, you have to be very careful because the, typically there's a high temperature step and uh, if you pick up a bit of polymer, then the polymer expands, it expands more than black phosphorus. And then when you cool it down, uh, you, you get a, a built-in strain. And in fact, that's how we get compressive strength. So we have that degree of control. So if we want a device with a built-in compressive strain, we can for the uh, transferred layers. Um, and uh, uh, of course, we can also make them relaxed to be uh, mechanically relaxed. Um, now for some of our wafer-based processing, as of now, we don't have an ability to engineer the strain yet, but we are looking into that. So, so right now, everything that we're building wafer scale is uh, mechanically relaxed, which is just totally fine, but we wanna also build, you know, build strategies for multicolor. to a question online. So can you comment on uh, the stability of your molydisulfide uh, AC LEDs and how scalable the fabrication is? But also maybe I can add one more question for your multicolor pixel LEDs. Can you comment on how small each pixel can be? Uh -huh. good, uh, good questions. So, um, so let me maybe first go to the uh, second question, which is the, the size size of each pixel. Um, the way we do the fabrication, um, I didn't really talk in detail about the, um, the, uh, the source electrode that we're using for organics. Um, it's in the, the details are in the paper. The source electrode has to be closely spaced because organics have very low mobilities and quantum dots the same way. You can't get charge injection easily from one dot to another dot. So we have to have very closely spaced electrodes. And for that, we use a network of carbon nanotubes. But uh, these carbon nanotubes have a spacing. The spacing on average is 100 nanometers. They're randomly distributed. Uh, the gate fields can still go through them. The nanotube is just one to two nanometers in diameter. They're very small. They don't block off the fields from underneath. And um, we pattern a nanotube network, and then we put uh, a metal contact to the nanotubes with a bond pad. This is done by lithography. Of course, we can also print, print these electrodes. Um, so we can make them as small as we want. And in fact, the smallest that you could do is single quantum dot. And we have done that on, on published results. So the smallest pixel size would be single quantum dot. And here, I forgot what the, sorry, it's in the paper, uh, don't quote me, but it's on the order of a, probably on, on the order of 100 micron, the, the size of the pixel. 
Now, when you micro dispense, then the question is how good is your micro dispensing capabilities, right? And so in this case, uh, actually we were manually micro dispensing. And uh, so we came up with a pixel size that we were comfortable with. And this was the pixel size that we used here. So here the solution, it's in solution printed and your 2D materials are CBD. There is, that's right. So here for organics, there is no 2D material. This is all using different emitters, organics, quantum dot, solution, solution uh, process. Now for the, uh, the other question was for the 2D materials, uh, this one. And um, so the CVD of uh, these uh, uh, transition metal by chalcogenides is now a relatively well-established process. And um, what Joy did in our lab was, the, the focus in our lab was not just to make the monolayer uniform, but was to make it uniform and bright. And, um, and actually I should give her one more credit. In the same paper, she observed that when, when she was growing the samples, they were very bright and they didn't have any droop as grown. And we had actually attributed it to the mechanical strain. So we knew strain was doing something. And, uh, but we weren't sure quite what it was doing. <laughs> and um, because we know during growth, they can be strained because of the thermal expansion coefficient mismatch. And um, when, during the processing, we released the strain. So we, have a, we, have, we understand how to release the strain well. So uh, the strain was released here. And, um, um, and the question was then the stability of the device. These devices, the AC electroluminescent devices can get fairly hot, depends on how, how much you're pushing them because you're turning them on and off, on and off, on and off. And if you wanna get really bright um, emission, especially a monolayer, you really need to drive them high. And so you need to inject a lot of charge in them within each uh, transition. And, um, uh, but, but as long as you do the measurements in a vacuum, they're pretty stable. And we do have the, the long, long uh, measurement, long lifetime measurement in the paper. Uh, I forgot what you saw, but uh, you can ask Joy, she's sitting back there, she would know better. <laughs> Great, so all these devices are measured uh, under inert conditions or vacuum. Uh, for AC electroluminescence, you, you, it's, yes, you should, you, we, yeah, and you can of course package them. You can do uh, so. A question was, would you know uh, the effect of humidity? I would assume there's going to be some degradation. Yeah, we don't want we don't want to uh, measure these devices. Uh, just like organic devices, you want to you want to encapsulate them. You want to, and, and that's well established now. Makes sense. Um, for for at least for OLED technologies, well established. Makes sense. So there is a question. Thanks for your talk. Uh, sorry if I missed this, but is there a particular reason for doing side contacts to the 2D materials in your LED devices versus like a transparent top contact? Yeah, really good question. So the question is, can we do, can we build a vertical device instead? And uh, uh, so for black phosphorus, uh, maybe if, uh, okay, perfect. So black phosphorus, in fact, our device was a vertical device. Um, so for black phosphorus, we are building a vertical device. Now for black phosphorus, the BP thickness is, um, we typically like to work tens of nanometer in thickness. So that's, that's our thickness. Uh, we're not working in monolayer. Now for transition metal dichalcogenides, they're only direct band gap when they're monolayer. So when you go to bilayer, they're not interesting anymore optically, and uh, at least for light emission. So, uh, so if you have a monolayer, um, you gotta be very careful with what you put on it. So, you know, because you can get quenching easily. So uh, of course there are strategies to, you know, that, that, that is traditionally used for quantum dots and for organics and perovskites now with whole selective, uh, the, the, barrier trans the barrier layers and then the whole select selective layers. And that may be possible um, uh, to explore in the future, uh, but uh, it's more challenging certainly it's, uh, than, than just using this AC injection mechanism. Awesome, we are out of time, but there's a reception right after, so you can feel free to stay and ask your questions if you have any. Let's thank uh, Professor Javi again. Thank you.